Okay, so for anybody who has a question just about uh, slope finding, this should cover it. Remember we talked about how for any two points, from there to there, if there's a line that goes to those two points, we're going to find the slope of that line. We need to find the rise and the run. So let's make it, uh, so, that, so this would be in the positive y's. Remember how we talked about, we just want to know how far is it from there to there, or if I started here, say I started at $2 and then I went up to $30, then I just want to find the change. Right? The change in that, in those values. So the change we represent with a Greek letter. What Greek letter is that? Do you remember? Delta. Delta, right? Change in whatever Y is. Right? If Y is in dollars, we find the change in the dollars. That's what's represented vertically in that case. So once you find the change in Y, that would be Y2 minus Y1. That would be if we're calling it a, a delta Y X rise run, that's going to be that part, y2 minus y1. Along the x is all very similar to what I just said about y. We want to find a change in x. That's going to be x2 minus x1. So and that's what we find there. So we'll do that for each of these. We will most often choose to call this point 2 and this point 1. We'll call this point 1 and this point 2 for this other line. The line one, we're going to take 0 minus 2, 0 minus 2, then go back over here and do 5 minus negative 3. Negative 2 over 5 plus 3, 8. Negative 1, 4. All right, good. Any mistakes? Oh, it's still okay. I look pretty good about that subtraction I just did. Right, now we'll do line two. Two. Do y2 minus y1, negative 3, minus negative 4, and then come back over here, 3, minus negative 1. Negative 3 plus 4, and 3 minus negative 1, 4. So positive 1 over positive 4. I just want to quickly point out. If I were to do, instead of negative 3 minus negative 4, I did negative 4 minus negative 3, right? In this order, negative 4 minus negative 3. As long as I come back here for the first one, negative 1 minus 3, okay? Might have kind of an in between step here, but I'll get, in this case, negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1, but negative 1 minus 3 is also negative. Four, and negative divided by negative is positive, so we've got a positive one for it. Okay. So positive one fourth, negative one fourth, so they parallel or perpendicular or neither? Neither. Uh, neither. They're, they kind of look like the same slope, so it's, it's kind of like they're parallel. It also is kind of like what you need when you want to see perpendicular lines, right? But neither one of them. Either for parallel, we need what kind of slopes? Equal. Equal slopes, right? One fourth and one fourth, negative one fourth and negative one fourth. For perpendicular lines, we need what kind of slopes? We need opposite, opposite reciprocals, which we just don't have either one of those. If it's if if one is one fourth, the other one has to be negative four over one. And it's not. Questions about that? Somebody asked a question for a reason. If I mean, if, they, if this has answered your question, then great. But if not, then uh, speak up. All right. Okay. Then next, that's for the other so sixteen. Let's do one to sixteen. So finding an error and finding the slope. Okay. Let's just point at it. So we take five, wait, right away. The only five that exists is this guy right here, right? 
What would be wrong about that and finding a slope? That's an x coordinate. We need in the numerator, we need y coordinates. We just went over that. So it looks like maybe they just reversed the y's and the x's. Well, yeah, that's what I thought. I said y2 is not like uh, 1. Um, yeah. So I don't know, but that was like wrong, I guess. y is not 1. If you want to get a little deeper and get exactly to what they did, it looks like they did x2, let's see, minus negative 1. Is that, yeah, see, that's the other x, is x2 minus x1 over y2 minus y1. And they got them like in the right order, but they the numerator is not in there. If, if slope is rise over run, what do they have? Run over rise. Run over rise, and that's not how slopes work. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, then next, the answer is 25. Okay, that's good. Let change. Pretty important concept. Asking us to find the rate of change or average rate of change. Whatever. We're finding the average rate of change, right? Uh, this x is measured in gallons, so like this is gallons and this is gallons, and this is measured in miles. This is miles. This is miles. So when we find the slope, let's see what happens. We got 50 minus 11. What are these measured in? What are the units of these two things? Miles. Miles. So miles. Units 50 minus 11, what? Miles over. Okay, 50 minus 11, so 3. Minus 11. Zero. Oh. Oh. Gallons. Gallons. Right. To understand that this is a rate of change, all we have to do is just write the units of the things that we're subtracting. Because when we get done, we'll find uh, 39, what's that again? Yeah. 39 miles. Or three gallons. It's convenient that 39 is divisible by three because then we get 13 miles per one gallon. And that's what we mean when we say something like 13 miles per gallon. When we put miles per gallon, what we mean is 13 miles per one gallon. Percent per mile per hour per second per whatever, per one of those things, per second, per one second, per one year, per one gallon. Well, what happens if we do all the math? Okay, we, we've done a couple of slopes. So we do the slope and we find that we get seven over five, and this is measured in inches. And this is measured in years. Well, that's not quite inches per year, right? It's seven years, or seven inches per five years. Which is a rate of change, but that's not how we normally think of it. Right? Does that make sense? Normally, uh, we say something miles per gallon. Something miles per gallon. So how many, can we expect, ex express this in inches per year? How many inches we go in how many years? How many years is this? One. One year. How many inches did we go in one year? What's that? Seven by 1.4. How'd you do that? Seven. Seven divided by five. Like we actually want, if we're not just talking about the slope of a line, if we're talking about slope of a line, this is a lot easier to use, right? Of seven over five. If we want to talk about a rate of change, we want to talk about how fast something is going, how much money we're making per hour, all that kind of stuff. We want to do per one thing, per one hour, per one year, per one second, right? Yes? Okay. Yeah. Hey, you asked a lot of questions, but I'm just trying to answer them. Right? So we want to go ahead and divide these and express it as a decimal, usually, to get a good idea. It's hard to imagine what it looks like for something to move seven inches every five years. It's hard to get a picture of that. But if I tell you 1.4 inches in one year, you can kind of make a bit, an animation of that. Right? Imagine one year goes by, it moves just a little bit in that year, 1.4, just a little over one, almost one and a half inches in a year. It's easier to understand. We are talking about slope, we just leave it as 7 over 5. 
Um, what moves that slowly? Glacier. Okay, maybe a glacier will move that. Is actually, I was at Glacier National Park. It was named Glacier National Park. This was several years ago. Uh, I had just moved to Montana not, not long before that. We came up to the campground, little booth where you pay and all that kind of stuff. And it was uh, like park ranger or I don't know what exactly his title was, but just it was a Glacier National Park and I pulled up there and I said, I have a question. He says, yes, and I said, what is a glacier? Because I didn't know what a glacier was. I had no idea what a glacier was other than it's like this icy thing. And part of its definition is it has to move a certain amount per year. I forget now, it's been years ago. But so that's one of the definitions of a glacier. It has to be so big and it has to be so thick and it has to move at a certain rate, some number of, I think it's feet maybe per year. Things move really slowly. The moon moves really slowly away from the Earth. And its actual distance from the Earth changes really slowly. Um, Hawaii and, and, and you know tectonic plates move really slowly. Uh, anyway, all those examples of things that move slowly. All right. Um, next, we just did 25, so let's do 47. Mr. Sheriff, my main question was Part B. Just Part B, okay. Um, so, Part B. Does the roof satisfy the building code? I don't know what the building code is, so we're going to go up here, right? So, a, a the building code, or a building code, requires the minimum slope. Minimum slope. That, right? Words like minimum imply there's maximums and there's bigness and smallness. You see what I'm getting at? Some slopes are bigger than other slopes, correct? A minimum slope. So the slope that that meets the code is minimum or at least some slope. Right? It meets this slope at least. Okay, so if we are to meet code, our slope of our roof has to be at least whatever we find out next. Uh, or pitch, okay, it's called pitch. Of an asphalt shingle roof must rise three feet for each twelve feet of run. So it's gotta have a slope. Three over twelve. One over four. Construction codes are weird like that. Why don't they just say rise every one foot for every four feet? Why would they say three for twelve? It's, but it's like that a lot in construction. Uh, the asphalt shingle roof of an apartment building has the dimensions shown here. What is the slope? Okay, so apparently we found that. Right? Fifteen over eighty. No. Forty. Forty, not eighty. Uh, what is the rule? Yeah, three over, uh, where would you have to divide by five? So eight, three over eight. When I did that, I thought, like, like I didn't realize that eight was steeper than 12 at first. Like, uh, so I thought it was, like, smaller oh. than I thought about it. We could, yeah, we can think about it in, uh, in several different ways. Uh, if we just take this as minimum, right? The smallest that it can be is 3 twelfths, or 1 fourth, or you know, anything that's equivalent to 1 fourth, 3 twelfths. Um, so if our number that we come up with is this or bigger, then we're good, right? Well, how can I compare 3 eighths and 3 twelfths, or 3 eighths and 1 fourth? Can I compare those things? Well, yeah, some three twelfths we probably could. You know, it would be a little easier is if we did what? Common denominator. Common denominator. Common denominator. What's the common denominator between three eighths and one fourth? Eight. Eight. So you just multiply this by two. It equals two eighths. So which has a bigger slope? Which one has a bigger value for the slope? Two. Three eighths. 
three eighths is bigger than two eighths. Right? What do I have? You know, if I have three apples, right? That's the kind of the same thing as saying eighths. I have three out of eighths. I have three of apples. Three out of eighths. I have two of eighths. Three eighths is more than two eighths. Three is bigger than two. Right? I have more of them there than I do here. Why, why would a roof even have a pitch? Why would it have a slant to it? Yeah? So, um, if there's like a heavy snowstorm, ah. if it's tilted, the snow can slide off. If yes. it's not tilted, the snow will pile up and it can break the roof. There we go. We want the, we want the, s the snow to slide off. And so, also rain, too. And rain. We don't want rain to pool up there. Well, so what is, I mean, if, if the pitch were, if the roof were steeper, would that, serve that purpose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the steeper the roof, the better it is as letting, like a, a vertical wall is not going to collect very much rain or snow, so right? The steeper it gets, the worse it also gets because then you have more wind resistance on the top of it. Okay. Well, it doesn't give it, like, it doesn't give us a maximum pitch, right? So it could be an infinite pitch. You could just go up front like that. Then when rain comes, you're done. Well, that's, <laughs> I'm sorry, that wasn't in the code, so I'm not really going to pay any fines. Yeah, so here's the thing, if the pitch, we could, we could look at it differently, like we could compare these two, because the numerators are the same, which is a little bit more weird. Right? This one rises three, three for every 12. Let's call that 12. 12 is that three. Well, this rises three for every eight. Right? So this rises the same, but you only have to go to eight. Right? So this, this roof of three eighths is steeper. It will let snow and rain and things run off of it uh, be more efficiently than one that has a 3 twelfths slope. So there's another way. Both ways we conclude 3 eighths is bigger than 2 eighths or 3 twelfths or 1 fourth. So it is bigger than the minimum, so it does meet the code. Okay? And it exceeds the code by how much? 1 eighth, right? 3 eighths, 2 eighths, 1 eighth, or 2 eighths, 3 eighths. Okay, so we're on to 3.3 number 13. Or 2.3, not 3. What are we doing here? Graphing the equation. Right, this is wrong? So we're supposed to graph this equation, y equals 4x minus 1. If I know nothing about what this graph is supposed to look like, or any graph ever in my life ever, how can I start to get an idea of what the graph is supposed to look like? It'll start on negative 1. No, 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 no. That's starting with an idea. <laughs> if I have no idea, yes? Well, you know it's going to be a positive slope. No, I don't have any idea of what this is supposed to look like. Would you like. plug in 0? In fact, anything. Right? Anything. Zero is the best. Zero is definitely the best. I think there's no arguing about that. Okay? Zero for x gives us nothing there, right? And so we're just left with negative one. Negative one. Okay? If I'm thinking really hard and I'm extrapolating this to all functions that look just like this, anything that looks like this, why don't I always just plug zero in there really fast and always get b as the y value? When we plot the y-intercept, we're just doing this. We're plugging in 0 for x and getting out the y really, really fast. That's what we're doing. It's not magic. It's just plugging in 0 for x. OK, what would be the next thing that would be very easy to plug in for x? 1. Sure, 4 times 1, is that easy to do? Certainly, probably the easiest thing to multiply 4 by, except for 0. So we'll plug in 1. 4 times 1 is 4 minus 1. Points, 0, negative 1, 1, 3. All right, how many more plot points can we plot? Billions. Billions, thank you, billions. So if we were to plot billions of points, we get all these points, and then this thing would start to look like a 
one line. Okay, so we know that. Let's say we know that. Any points that we plot are just going to wind up going in a straight line, the same straight line that goes in between these two points. If you keep going past these two points, no matter what value we plug in for x, and when we find y, it's going to land right on this line. So right now we have, we have plotted billions of points by drawing that line. There it is. If we keep doing this over and over and over, we realize, mm -hmm. well, I can plug in 0 for x really easily and find negative 1 for the y. I can easily get 0 comma this number. So I'll just do that right away. I don't even have to plug it in and really think about it that hard. 0, negative 1 is a point on y. Next thing I'll do is plug in the easiest thing I can for x. Well, this is just the number 4. Right? It's not even a fraction. So I'll just multiply 4 times 1 because that's the easiest multiplication to do. So I'll move over 1, over to x equals 1. And I know that that's going to give me a 4 more, 4 more than the negative 1 I started with. So over 1 and up 4 is the origins of our slope. Right? Every time I move over 1, I'm just going to move up 4 more. Mm -hmm. okay. Move over another one, put in 2, move over another one. I'm going to move up 4 more from there. Move, up and move over another one, move up 4 more from the previous one. Okay. And there's the origins of our y-intercept and slope idea. It's just fast. Like If we had a job that paid per graph that we graphed, we want to do it as fast as possible, and then if we're really uh, ingenious, we're going to say, I'll put this guy on the y-axis, easy, I know that's always going to work because I can plug in 0 for x. Then, I was just plug in an easy number for x, like whatever the denominator is of the fraction. This fraction has a denominator of 1, so any multiple of 1 will do. And I'll just keep going over that much on x and going up by whatever the numerator is of that fraction. Over and up and over and up. Or up and over and over. Right? So can't you just always look at it and say it goes negative 1 on the y-axis mm -hmm. and rise over the run and you don't right. need to plug anything in? Yeah. Right, but we only want to arrive at that because we understand why that is a shortcut. Right? A shortcut to what a graph is, a graph is, is a bunch of points each representing an input and output. If I can understand easily, quickly, that the two points that are easiest to find are when I plug in x is well, when I plug in x is 0, and when I plug in x is the multiple of the denominator, then I can start to just, that's what I'm talking about. We get paid per graph, we want to do them as fast as possible, we start to under, we start to recognize that pattern in all functions that look like this. Yeah, that look like y equals mx plus b. Mm -hmm. But, if I get a question, like, do I have any more questions? Yeah, number 13, and it's that, I'm going to go through this again. Again and again until I don't get any more questions about it. Right? I don't mind getting questions about it, but that's going to be my explanation because it's absolutely true. If I just say, you know, put the y-intercept and the slope, that's not an answer. It's just the shortcut without any explanation. Okay. And uh, and you know, if that's your question, you're like, well, I think I was supposed to do that. Well, that came out exactly like I did get doing the y-intercept and the slope, so I must have done it right. So here we go. There's more. Was, what was that? 13? 13. And then we have 16. Okay. <sighs> right. So I've been doing this for a while. I'm getting paid per graph. I want to do this as fast as possible. I realize if I plug in 0 for x, just get the, the constant that's just hanging out by itself. It's left all alone. I'll get 1 for y. So 0 for x gives me 1 for y. There's your y. If I follow the slope, I'm going to go up. I'm going to go, uh, well, depends on how I think of it. I'm going to go up 5 into the left 4 or down 5 into the right 4. I'm going to go right. I like, I like positive x's, so I'm going to go that way. I don't want to plug 1 in here because that's going to give me a fraction. I have to find a common denominator to add them together, and then I have a fraction that I'm supposed to graph. I want whole numbers if I can get there. If I plug in 4, exactly, if I plug in 4 for x, I do just that, negative 5 fourths, right? When I plug in 4, this is the over 4 of the slope, right? Over 4. Over 4. And down 5. Uh, plus 1, so it cancels. That leaves me with negative. 
so I'm going to take one minus five, I'm gonna start at one and go down by one, two, three, four, five. That puts me at negative four, of course. How do I do that? I put in x is four. There's my down five and over four. So I just plotted trillions of points, I'm drawing that line because I know that all the points were in. I feel like I moved past the question too quickly, just let me know when I come back. Two, three. getting paid per graph that we draw in our imaginations. I'm not paying you any money for these. But if you were to get paid per graph, you'd want to do it as fast as possible. It's just a game of finding two really easy points to find. In this case, what would I plug in for whatever that would make it really easy to find a point really quickly? One for x. Zero for x. Zero for x. One is, is quick, but zero is even faster. Because I plug zero in there for, for that, and that just goes away. So I get negative six y equals negative 12 and y is 2. So I've just found the point 0 for x, 2 for y. Okay, that was easy. I'm halfway there. 0 for x, 2 for y. What would be easy to do almost exactly the same as that? Plug in 0 for y. If you want to put it in y-intercept or slope-intercept form and then do it that way, that's going to give you the same graph, of course. But this way is, I think, a little bit easier. We put in zero for y, we get two x equals negative 12. x is negative six. Negative six comes zero. And there we go. All right, just a game, a game of find two points really quickly. I would bet that I can find those two points. If I get really good at this, then I, I don't really have to write all this down, right? I can just plug into the other, all right, so y is obviously two. X is gonna be clearly negative six when I get those things. I can just cover up the x term and solve that equation, cover up the y term, solve that equation, and I'm done. I found two points. If I, if I need to spend more time on that, just let me know. Here's a good one. Okay, the graph needs to be, it needs to show me all the places on the plane where this is true, where this is true. Let's start with the easiest place for that to be true. Where is x equal to negative five at? Zero y. Zero y, so we move this way, uh, one, two, three, four, five halves. That's where x is equal to negative five halves. Where else is x equal to negative five halves? Everywhere up and down. Where is x equal to negative half, negative five halves? Here and here and here and here and all along here. That's where x is equal to negative five halves. There and there, not there. Those are accidental. Those are all the places on the plane where x is equal to negative five halves. Negative five halves ten. Negative five halves negative thirty. I 
think the method I would use is get x equal so you like isolate x, right? So I add 3 to both sides. x equals positive 3. Now it's a lot like x equals negative 5 halves. Where is x equal to 3? Here. Okay. And here. And here. Here. Anywhere that is 3 to the right of where x is equal to 3. All along there. And the same would be true for y. Like if y was equal to 3, well then all of these are the points where y is equal to 3. So that turns out to be horizontal. And last, 65. when they just give you an equation and you have to build the equation. It's a little more of a challenge, but they give it to you. The context would be this is the number of hours you spend running and this is the number of hours you spend walking. You're going to run a little bit, going to walk a little bit, and eventually we, when we're done we'll have gone 14 miles. So let's go to graph this equation. So it's just a game of finding two points. What's the, what would be the easiest way to find a point in this scenario. Zero for either thing, right? For both things, right? And not at the same time, two different times. One time I'm plugging zero for x, one time I'm plugging zero for y. Well, what's x and what's y in this case? Yeah, r and w. Which is x and which is y? r and x. Okay. Would it be wrong if I said this was w and this was r? No, no, no. Hey, how could we not? We have to decide. Right? I guess if x and y go in alphabetical order, r and w could go in alphabetical order. Who knows? It doesn't really matter. So we plug in 0 for x or r. So 0 for r. We get 3.5 w equals 14. We divide by 3.5 and w equals what? 14 divided by 4. 4. All right. Next we put in 0 for w. Because 6r equals 14. I know it's 14 over 6. 7 over 3. I'm going to leave it like this, so uh, 7 over 3. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 thirds. That's right there. That's the R axis. W axis, we're going to go up to 4. And every other point would land somewhere on this line. Draw a line. Draw trillions and trillions and trillions of points just now. Back of your iPhone is probably the answer to this problem. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it says give three possible combinations of running and walking. We run a little bit, we walk a little bit. What's one possibility for where I ran this much and I walked this much or vice versa? Run two miles. Okay, run two miles. Two miles? Hours would be a little easier to plug in here. Six times two plus three point five times walking hours. Right, so three point five W equals two. Right? This is twelve. Subtract twelve on both sides. There we go. Divide two by three point five. What's two divided by three point five? Point three three repeating. Point three three repeating. So you mean one third. So there's one possibility. Uh, w equals one third when r equals two. So I can run for two hours and walk for a third of an hour. How long is a third of an hour? Minutes. Uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes walking and two hours running. What's another possibility? Um, I need number four. Plug in. Number four? Number four. Like this? Like the number four. The number four, okay. like this. Yes. And you got zero for the other? No, like Oh, you plugged in four plugged for this guy. Four. Oh, okay. So you plugged in four for uh, R and got? Uh, negative 2.9. Negative 2.9. Mm -hmm. Okay. Negative 
0.9. And how about this one? Or this one? Like these are both possibilities too, right? Yeah. We walked how or what does this zero mean? Ran. Ran zero hours. And we walked four for four hours. hours. Or we could walk for zero hours and run for seven thirds of an hour. <laughs> Two and a third hours. Yeah, that Hold one wouldn't on. work. That one wouldn't work. Hold on. That's the same as this. Like the total time is, is two and a third. Yeah, Somewhere we did something seven wrong. Thirds of an hour. Seven thirds of an hour, that's two and one third hour. Yeah, that's two and three. So it's not one hour, right? No. Right. Okay. It's not one. But this total is two and a third. Did we do this right? 14 minus 12. Two okay. divided by 3.5. Does that come out to one third? What? It doesn't come out to one third. Yeah. Uh, I just, I don't know. You said point three repeating. That's not correct. Okay, I'll do it myself. I'll take Wait, it out. Can yes. I, can I show how I did it? Because I, I did it. Like, that's how you did it. Just plug some stuff in. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That's how I did it. Of course. You plug stuff in? Yeah. Like, I kind of did it like this one, except for. So you got point six. Boom. Not point two repeating. Huh. So that's better. <laughs> okay. Assuming we're all done with questions from the homework, and we're gonna pass in our homework and get ready for the review. This looks like this. The quiz. This looks like a person who's ready. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Uh, if we want to tell if two lines are parallel or perpendicular or whatever, it's not enough to just look at the graphs and guess. Because even if we had the most perfect graphs ever, two lines could look parallel and not actually be parallel. And vice versa with perpendicular. It could look par perpendicular and not be perpendicular. The only way to know for sure is to look, are they, well, exactly the same slantiness? Well, then they'd be parallel, right? It means they have the same slant. Are they, like, opposite in every way? Well, then they'd be perpendicular. Opposite in every way would be, if one's positive, one's negative. If one is three fourths, the other is four thirds. So let's take a look at both of these and see what we find out. So we're going to take y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1, 7 over 5. Right? That's line 1, line 2. 5 minus 0 over 3 minus negative 4, and 5 over are they the same? No. They're not equal. So they're not parallel. They're not parallel. Are they opposite reciprocals? No. 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 They are reciprocals, but not opposite. opposite. Okay. If they were opposite reciprocals, it'd be seven fifths. This would be negative five sevenths, or vice versa. And those would be perpendicular. What are these two lines? Neither. They're nothing. They're, they intersect somewhere in a very uninteresting way, apparently, because they don't have an angle. It's a very interesting way they intersect. So this is going to be the something out of five? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. So we did all this, and then we said, oh, perpendicular? No, no, that's like four out of five. Like, oops. That's not like that. We did all the math right, but we just kind of made the wrong conclusion. And that, you know, I would probably mark that three out of five. That, that's a concept. Okay. Any questions about that? We did that in there. Unless we can't, and we need to ask a question, that's fine. Um, 
So look at the slope from line or from line one of question one. So let's go and grab that seven fifths. All right. So if x were measured in years and y were measured in inches, what would be the rate of change of y relative to x? So what did, it, what did we get this 7? How did we calculate 7? And those were what kind of values? Y. Y values. Yes, they were y values. So these are y values. Y is measured in? Inches. So this is seven inches. And what was x ray measured in? Years. Years. Oh, I guess seven fifths was in there. This came exactly this number came up in uh, my example before. Right? Seven oh. inches in five years. Mm -hmm. Seven fifths. Seven fifths inches per one year. One point four inches per year. However we want to write it, that's all fine. Seven inches per five years, seven fifths of an inch per year, or 1.4, which is per year, all these are great. These are all rates of change. This is probably the most common, <laughs> easiest to understand. That would be good. Graph. Paid for a graph, we want to graph it as fast as we can. Pump out these graphs as fast as we can. So we put in a zero for x, we're getting good at this. Zero for x, negative three for y, of course. So there's a point really fast. I know if I move over six, if I put in six for x, that'll cancel out that six right there, right? I'll just add five on. Cancel out that six, add five. Negative three plus five. Negative three, one, two, three, four, five. And over six. Go to another nice point, I can go over another 6, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to 12, right? That's the next multiple of 6. I just go up 5 more. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right there. I, mean, I could go that forever. Ad infinitum. Again, pumping up these graphs as fast as possible, making the best, quickest decisions. That would be plug in zero for x, plug in zero for y. Once we've done both of those, we'll have two points. <sighs> plug in zero for x, we get 3y equals 21, y is 7. Plug in zero for y, 7x equals 21, x equals 3. <laughs> The only reason x equals 3 and y equals 7 is because I wrote it that way. It's a coincidence. It's not a rule to live by. Okay? So don't fall into that pit. If I had made this 42, then that wouldn't have happened. There are little rules we could make, but they would wind up being more complicated than just plug something in for x and something in for y, and you're done. 0, comma 7, 3, comma 0. You got a lot. Okay, so imagine you're saving up for a, a box set of DVDs that'll cost $180. Huh? All right. Uh, we work two different jobs. One of them pays six dollars an hour. The other ten. Uh, so, but in this case, I mean, really, I could I could have asked you just this. I could have cut out all that other stuff. Just give me this equation and said find two solutions, correct? Yeah. yeah. But the context, in the context, what does x represent? Hours. Mm -hmm. Hours where? At work. What, which job. work? One. Or job job one. one. Job one. Okay, job, job one. one. This would be number of hours at job two. Yeah? Okay. So you want to find mm -hmm. two solutions? Plug in some of the and figure out why, what y is, or vice versa, right? You got a solution? Put a zero for x. x or y, right? But you said x, let's do x. 10y equals 180. Y equals 18. So here's the solution. Zero hours at the $6 an hour job and all 18 hours spent 
had to, well, that's the smartest way to do it, isn't it? Because you can choose. Mm -hmm. I don't work all the hours with the best paying job. Another possibility, we said we can plug in zero for y. So we get 6x equals 180, x equals 30. So 30 hours at the not as good paying job. So this would be the best way to do it. That would be the worst way to do it. Right? I guess if best is less time and worst is more time. Or somewhere in between. Right? Going to work three hours at one place and see how many hours you have to work at the other. Six times three hours at this job plus ten times y hours. And we just solve for y. We got ten y equals 18, or 180 minus 18. So 168y equals 16.8 hours. There's a possibility. Whatever you want. Two is all we need. Two solutions. In case you're wondering, this is a, a solution, and this is another solution, and this is a third solution. Let's start solving some equations. Okay. Well, we took something like y equals x minus 4, right? That's a function. We can plug anything we want in for x and get something out for y. We've already been doing what we're about to do a little bit. If one of the values is decided, that's going to lock in the other value, right? It's going to make the other value have to be something. Right now, we would call them maybe variables. They would vary. They could be anything, right? Depending on what x is, y would be something. So they're variable, both variables. Once I decide that y is 12, and I want to figure out which x gives me a y of 12, would you call that a variable? Would you think that's a very good name for x? Does it vary? No. It doesn't vary at all. It is exactly how much? So it has to be 16. It couldn't be any other value. Okay? Some some equations have multiple solutions, like x could be this or this or this, but it's not like it could just be anything. Here it could be anything, here it has been decided to be, at least in this case, one thing. Okay, so we decided it was 16. You just look at it, right? Just look at it and see that it's 16. All right, let me give you a little uh, preachy, soapboxy thing. Okay? You can, in this equation, and you know what, maybe through all of algebra, maybe you had been able to get by just, quote, seeing it. Okay? You ever, there's a common thing for people uh, of this ilk. They go home, and their parents are trying to help them out, and then they, they, they say, well, here's the answer, and the parents say, well, how did you do that? I don't know. They just see it. Just see it. Or a common argument that's had between parents and teachers and this kind of a, a student. Please show your work. I don't need to show work. I can just see it. Okay? If you've ever not shown your work, because it's just so easy to see, cut that out. All right? Because there comes a time, and it's not very far away, where you can't just see it. Okay? I'll give you an extreme, it's not even the most extreme example. Okay, but I'll give you an extreme example from later in the year, all right? And it's not on this paper. It's on another piece of paper. It's all the way over here. I can just see this is 16. Put this up here. Can you just see the answer to that? No. Uh, you have all yeah. Smile on our faces, we say yes. Seriously, we say no. Okay? No, you cannot just see the answer. Right? You can't just see this one, sure. It, really, what you're doing is you're kind of like, what would I have to subtract 4 from to get 12? Well, I'll have to go to a number that's 4 bigger than 12. You're really doing what I'm asking you to do in your head. You're not showing it. Showing it is not just a way to dock you because you didn't show it. It's a way to document what we've done so that we can repeat it for more and more and more complicated situations. Here's a very complicated situation. And of course, there's even more complicated situations. But here's one from this particular course later this year. All right? And you can't see it. The best you can do here would be to guess. What could we guess? 
One, okay, we guessed one. Right, let's put one there and put one there. And understanding that is, is not insignificant, that one needs to go in both places and then we need to do add out and then it needs to come to zero. Like that's, that's a significant thing to understand. It's just not a good place to end your understanding. All right? So we put one there, we get one plus two minus five is not zero. Right? So that didn't work. Huh? Try. Well, okay, we're going to add five to both sides and say, well, that stuff has to equal five. All right? What's that? You got it? Yeah. What is it? I, I think it is 0 0.79056941 Exactly? <laughs> That's exactly the right answer? I think so. Go up there and show it. How did you come up with that? Go up there and write it. By doing math? Brennan, go up there and write it. Go write it. Hold on, let's just check it. Yeah. Point seven nine. Come on now. Point seven nine zero five zero five six nine four one five squared plus two times point seven nine zero five six nine four one five minus five. Oh my god. Let's get our calculators. Point seven nine zero Four one five. I'm just gonna store that as x and save myself some time. Now I'm gonna do x squared. Where's the square? Squared plus two times x minus five. All right. So every x is same <laughs> as as that. Not sweet. Not even close. Oh, okay. Not even. <laughs> Good try though. Good try. Uh, really, you were trying to use some algebra, but there's definitely some mistakes there. I didn't solve them. All right. Even if we did put in a really close decimal, all we're going to get is something that's really close to zero. Because here are the answers. There's two of them. Here are the exact answers. Negative 2 plus the square root of 24 divided by 2. The other one is negative 2 minus the square root of 24. 2. Would you have ever guessed this? No. <laughs> a serious look on a smile on your face. I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, no, I've never even heard of that. So that's not to intimidate because once we get there, if we have been paying attention and if we have been listening to Mr. Stewart and, and believing what he's telling us, and when we get here, all this is not that big a deal. It's not that complicated. All right? We have to start today with this. Okay? To solve this equation, just sit there and say, oh, I can see it. You need to treat it like an equation. Okay? So when I say add four to both sides, let's do that, okay? Show that work, all right? And, and as we progress and we do stuff like that more complicated, all right, those steps are gonna be done in our heads, but we're not thinking, I just see it. I'm doing the steps, I'm adding four to both sides, and I've arrived, right? I add four to this side, what's that doing? Well, negative four plus four is? Is? It's zero. X plus nothing. Well, that's just equal to x, right? That's what I have yeah. on that side. So it's not equal to 12, right? Because if I add 4 to this side. You have to add 4 to the other side. Yeah, and here's why. This is an equation right here. This is what an equation represents two sides balanced in perfect equilibrium, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Wait, how's that balanced, though? What do you mean, how's that balanced? Like one side. Yeah, how's it balanced? Oh, there's, there's, go oh, guess. Oh. Side. <laughs> Hard to see from over there. Okay, I'm holding it and I'm wiggling, and it, the scale isn't perfect, but this conveys the concept, right? If both sides are perfectly balanced, then mystery container, right? I took it so it's going to go off balance. I'm holding it back here. Mystery container is worth however many are over here. There's two, so mystery container is worth two. Okay. There's one inside, or one chip inside, and the container weighs the same as one chip, so x is worth two in this case. Okay? So if I add four to one side, well, if I add four, let's just real quick an example here. One, two, three, four. I'll show you what it looks like to add four to one side. Right, that side is four more, more heavy to balance that, we need this side to also increase by 4. So that then there will be, I won't actually do it, but you know it would be balanced. That's the idea behind it. Same thing on both sides. 
I know from experience when we talk when we when I hear students say do the same thing on both sides, they very often don't understand why that is. Okay? So we put the same thing on both sides, or we take away the same thing on both sides, or we double both sides, or we cut both sides down in half, or cut it down into a fifth of what it used to be, but we do the same thing on both sides so that both sides stay balanced. Come over here. This is balanced. By adding four, we can equal 16. So 16 equals that. And we do that, right? But we start now, we start now by doing the tedious little steps of add four to both sides rather than just say I can see that x has to be 16. Of course it does. Nobody's impressed no. anymore. If you knew that as a third grader, well, that'd be pretty right. impressive that you understood x is representing a number and that's just pretty cool stuff. But we've been in algebra for a while and nobody's impressed anymore. Okay? Now we have to have an algebraic approach, breaking it down, all right? So now let's talk about something like this. Oh, well, all right. I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. I see that. You can see that, okay. When we can't see it, we need a better approach. So what we want to know is this. What is one of these worth? How many do we know? Well, 12. We know that if I had 12 of these, it would be 144. I don't want 12 of these. I want 1 12th of that. Right? I'm going to somehow reduce 12 of these down to 1 of these. Well, if I divide that by 12, right? just look, I just look at one group of 1x, then I'll have x. So if we divide this by 12, figure out what 1 12th of this side is. You gotta divide by 12 on the other side. It must be equal to a 12th of the other side. Boom. And x is 12. Okay, but uh, what about if 3x equals 23? Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not 11. No. So how do we get to what x is? Divide so by 3 on each side. Divide by 3 on both sides. I want to know what one third of this is. One third of 3x would be 1x. Divide 23 by 3. It's what? 27. Or 7 point something. Yeah. 7 point 6 repeating. Or 23 divided by 3. Exactly. Brandon, don't attack. Shut up. Or 7 and 2 thirds. Whatever. Don't be tempted to write decimals. Unless you're saying 7 point 6 repeating miles, or like a unit or something, but if it's just a number, give me the exact number, there's no harm in it. I don't need to understand how big that number is because it's not anything. It's just a number. It's the number 23 divided by 3 or 7 and 2 thirds, exactly, exactly right. Okay, I have a question. Yes? <laughs> okay, so if you have to go 7.66, Repeating miles. Mm. Can you just write 7.67? No. It wouldn't be right. No, you have to go 7.6. 7.6 7. 6. 7. 6 with a line over is conceptually correct, but how do I like say tell a calculator exactly 7.6 forever? You can't. You can't. No matter how many sixes you write, it won't be correct. It won't be exactly okay. correct. But yes. Okay. So if you were going 7.6 repeating miles, and then they would calculate your time at that point, if there's an infinite, if there's infinite sixes after the seven, yeah. technically if you put your tires down to a molecular scale and follow them, wouldn't your tires technically go an infinite amount of sixes too? When you get all done, you'll have gone all the distances of two thirds. Everybody knows like seven and two thirds. That's what an infinite number of sixes is equal to. So you would have traveled seven point infinite sixes? Yeah. If we get to the direction part, I'll tell you something that I'll rule it later on. All right. Three fourths of an x is equal to 15. Now, 12x equals something, you know, 12x equals 144. It's easy enough to say, well, you're giving me 12 times too much. Let me cut that down. I'll figure out what 1 12th is of that. Right? Those, those physically make sense 
Now we're starting to get into the more just abstract. Like, all I want is one x. I want one times x. Okay. Now it becomes about just manipulating the numbers. How can I manipulate these numbers in some way? How can I manipulate these numbers in some way? Get <laughs> one times x. <laughs> Multiply each side by four. That's true. Now you do four times three, four and then fifteen. Or no. Yeah, yeah, multiply each side by four thirds. And then divide by three. Okay, hold on. So let's multiply by four, you say? Mm -hmm. Multiply by four. Okay, multiply, I don't know why I use versus, but I multiply by four, that's four over one, right? It makes it easier to, to do, right? Okay, multiply this by four. Number eight, great. Uh, so we get 12 over four. Well, 12 over four, that says three. Three. Three x equals 60. Divide by three. And divide by three. X equals 20. Or, Mitch? You can multiply each side by 4 thirds. Yes. Or the reciprocal of the fraction. What we should learn here is that multiply by 4 thirds is multiplying by 4 and dividing by 3. Just at, all at once. Right? Let's see what happens. What do we get? 12 over 12. That's just what? 1 times X. Same idea, right? Exactly the same idea. Multiply by 4 and divide by 3, I'll just do it all at once. And on this side, we can get 60 over 3, or 3 can cancel with 15. We get 5 times 4, 20. And again, 1x equals, y equals 2, but Whoa. it's supposed to be 20. <laughs> and what about just making it up as I go? Uh, I'll make this 14 because that actually, I want it to not come out nicely, that would come out nicely. Okay. So, Ooh, that's not okay. let's do, now, what am I trying, I'm trying to get 1 times x plus 0, divided by 1. You see what I'm doing? None of this stuff is changing, when I want to get 1x plus 0 minus 0 divided by 1, right? I want to do all this. I would like that to be left on one side by itself. What, what is this equivalent to? Just x? Right? I don't know what number it's equal to, but I do know it's equal to x. 1 times x? x plus 0 is x minus 0 is x. Divide x by 1. We still have x. We just want to get rid of all this other stuff that's hanging on to x. I cancel it all out. Now, Wait, you work through this one really fast before the bell rings? Mm -hmm. okay. So what would you do first? Uh, add 5. Add 5. Adding 5 is so easy, right? But the minus 5 is just hanging out there by itself. It's, it's easy pickings. You just pick it up. You add 5 to negative 5, you get 0. There's like plus 0. Oh, we've got to add 5 to this side too. So we have 3 sevenths x equals 19. <laughs> And what do we have? We have the exact same thing as before. Fraction times x equals number. Multiply by 7 thirds, or multiply by 7, and divide by 3. So x equals whatever 19 times 7 is. 133 over 3. Divide by 3. 133 divided by 3 is exactly 133 divided by 3. It's exactly that. Have a good day.